Poet X, page 180, final draft of assignment three, what I actually turn in. Xiomara Batista, Tuesday, November 6th, Miss Galliano, describes someone misunderstood by society, final draft. I've always found Nicki Minaj compelling. Although she gets a bad reputation for being overly sexual and making songs like Anaconda, I think the persona she portrays in her videos is really different from who she is in real life. So the question should be, does society distinguish between who someone actually is and the alter ego they present to the public? For example, Miss Minaj may have lyrics that some people feel are a bad influence, but then she's always tweeting people to stay in school. I also think society puts a negative spin on her music by saying she's allowing men to dictate how she raps, but a lot of her music shows a positive outlook on physical beauty. She is well-developed, and people always have a lot of negative things to say about her because of her body and how she talks about it and sex. But instead of being ashamed or writing something different, she celebrates her curves and what she wants. And all that is besides the fact that she also got bars, by which I mean to say she is very artistically talented. She's not just a great female rapper. She's a great rapper, period. Miss Minaj has held her own on tracks with some of the best rappers in the world. She is a woman in a male-dominated world making albums that go platinum. I know she's not considered most women's role model like Eleanor Roosevelt or Mother Teresa or even Beyonce, but I think she stands for girls who don't fit into society's cookie-cutter mold. Misunderstood, perhaps by some, But those of us who can relate, we get her. Wednesday, November 7th. Announcements. At the end of class, Miss Galliano brings in a student from her poetry club. He's a Puerto Rican kid I've seen around with glasses and a kind smile. He says his name is Chris, and he invites us to join the club. Then he does a short poem, using his hands and his volume to grab our attention. Miss Galliano looks on like a proud mama bear. And the class gives him half-hearted claps and a dap or two. Chris hands out flyers for the citywide slam and personally invites everyone to come to a poetry club meeting. The slam is three months away, February 8th. Miss Galliano says it's open to the public and even if we don't sign up, We should attend and support Chris and our peers. And I feel my face get hot. I should be there. I could compete. Ice skating. When I was little, mommy would take twin and me ice skating every year for our birthday, January 8th. She would work the holidays to make sure she had the afternoon off. I always think of ice skating as a gift. And although Twin is super uncoordinated, and I've always been a tank in tights, we were real good at skating. It was one thing we both did right. We took to the ice, falling only a few times before we streamed easily in the circular rink. Mommy would post up behind the glass, never rented skates herself, just watched us turn in circle after circle. This was a tradition for years. Until one day, it just wasn't. Until Twin and I stopped asking. Until I forgot what it felt like to slice through the cold, maybe like a knife, but mostly like a girl, skating with her arms out, laughing with her brother, while her mother took pictures in the falling snow. Until I completely forgot about the skating adventures we used to go on until Aman asked me to go skating. I tell him I have to be home straight after school and half days won't give us enough time. What about tomorrow? No school since teachers are grading exams and I'm stuck. It is a day off and one when mommy will be at work. So it's not like she'll know I'm not home. I begin to shake my head and then I remember how free I felt on the ice 
how wonderful it was. And I know I want Aman to see me feeling all that. Love. Turns out Aman loves winter sports. It's the last thing I would have imagined, but he names professional snowboarders and skiers and figure skaters in the same tone reserved for his favorite rappers. X, I'm serious. Even made Pops pay for a special TV channel so I could keep up. At first, I think he's joking, but the way his eyes light up, I can tell this is really a passion of his. Maybe like I'm writing. Like, maybe like my writing, a secret thing he's loved that he never felt he could talk about. He told me that in Trinidad, he was fascinated by snow, and watching the Winter Olympics was the closest he could get, and then that became a bigger love. X, I'm letting you know right now, I'm nice with the skates. Prepare to fall in love tomorrow. And my heart stutters over the word. How could I do anything but agree to the date? Thursday, November 8th. Around and around we go. The next day shines perfect. I invite Twin to come along, but he only turns his back to me and keeps on pretending to sleep. He's still upset about my showing up to his school, and I'm trying to give him space. Aman is near the skate rental when I arrive, and all around us kids are walking and laughing. He holds out a pair of skates, and after we're laced up and have rented a locker, we walk awkwardly to the ice. I take a deep breath at the pang of nostalgia. So many good memories at Lasker Rink. I hope to add one more. I step onto the ice, and it all comes back to me. Amon hasn't moved, and I backward skate, slowly crooking my finger at him. I blush immediately. I'm never the one to make the first move, but he seems to like it and steps onto the ice. He starts off slow, and we both face forward, skating side by side. Then it's like something comes over him. And I realize he wasn't lying. He's fucking amazing. Aman gets low and gains speed, then does turns and figure eights. I wait for him to start flipping and somersaulting, but he just slows down and grabs my hand. We skate that way for a while, then exit the rink to eat nachos. Aman, how did you learn all that? You're so, so good. He grins at me and shrugs. I came here and practiced a lot. My pops never wanted me to put me in classes, said it was too soft. And now his smile is a little sad. And I think about all the things we could be if we were never told our bodies were not built for them. After skating, when a man walks me to the train, he immediately pulls me to him. We never kiss so publicly, but with his lips on mine, I realize I want the same thing. And I know that it's stupid, too easy to run into someone from the block or one of mommy's church friends. <clears throat> but I just want to keep this moment going. When he tugs on my hand <clears throat> and pulls me even closer, I let him make me forget. Twins anger, confirmation class, the train smell, the people around us, or the stand clear of the closing doors, please. And I know people are probably staring, probably thinking horny high school kids can't keep their hands to themselves. But I don't care because when our lips meet, for those three stops before I get off, it's beautiful and real and what I wanted. We are probably the only thing worth watching anyways. Maybe we're doing our train audience a favor, reminding them of first love. This body on fire. Walking home from the train, I can't help but think Amon's made a junkie out of me. Begging for that hit, eyes wide with hunger, blood on fire, licking the flesh, waiting for the refresh of his mouth. Fiend, begging for an inhale, whatever the price, just so long as it's real nice. Real, real nice. Blood on ice. Ice. Waiting for that warmth.
that heat, that fire. He's turned me into a fiend, waiting for his next word, hanging on his last breath, always waiting for the next, next time. The shit and the fan. I hear mommy's yelling through the apartment door before I even turn the key, which isn't right because she shouldn't be home yet. It isn't even four o'clock. I mean, I did miss my stop because I didn't want to quit Amon's kisses. Se lo estaba comiendo. Had her tongue down his throat, some little dirty boy. I had to get off the train a stop early. And I know then, mommy's eyes were a fan, and my makeout session on the train was the shit hitting it. Lucky me, she's yelling from her bedroom, and I let myself into the one I share with twin, click the door shut, and slide down to put my head between my legs. I don't know how much time has passed before twin pushes open the door. And even though, even through the wall of his silence, he understands something is wrong. He crouches next to me, but I can't warn, warn him of the storm that's coming. I can't even be grateful. He's speaking to me again. I try to make all the big of me small, small, small. Miracles. My parents are still yelling in the bedroom, and because I never yell back at them, I don't scream at my father when he calls me a cuero. I don't yell how the whole block whispers when I walk down the street about all the women who made a cuero out of him. But men are never called cueros. I don't yell anything because for the first time in a long time, I'm praying for a miracle pinching myself and hoping this is all one bad dream. Trying to unhear my mother turn my kissing ugly. My father call me the names all the kids have called me since I grew breasts. God, if you're a thing with ears, please, please. Fear. Seal, what did you do now? I don't look at twin, because if I look at him, I'll cry. And if I cry, he'll cry. And if he cries, he'll get yelled at by Poppy for crying. He pushes up to standing, then kneels in front of me again, like his body doesn't know what to do. Seal? And I want to kick the fear in his voice. Seal, do they know you're home yet? Maybe you can sneak out through the fire escape. I I won't tell. I'll... But mommy's chancletas beat against the floorboards, and Twin and I both know. He pushes to his feet, and I see his hands are balled up into fists he'll never use. When the footsteps stop outside our door, I stand, brace my shoulders. I didn't do anything wrong, Twin. Go back to your homework, or your flirting, or whatever. I didn't do anything at all ants. Mommy drags me by my shirt to her altar of the virgin, pushes me down until I kneel. Look the Virgin Mary in the eye, girl. Ask for forgiveness. I bow my head hoping to find air. In the tiles, my big is impossible to make tiny, but I try to make ant of myself. Don't make me get more rice. Mira la Santa Maria in the eye. I've learned that ants hold 10 times their weight. Look at her, muchacha, mirala. Can crawl through crevices, have no God but crumbs. Last chance, Omara. Santa Maria, llena eres de gracias. They will survive the apocalypse. Little brown ants and hill building ants and fire ants, all red ant. I am not, I am no ant. My mother yanks my hair, 
pulling my face up from the tiles, constructing a church arch of my spine until Mary's face is an inch from mine. I am no ant, only sharply torn, something broken in my mother's hand. Diplomas. This is why you want to go away for college, so you can open your legs for any boy with a big enough smile. You think I came to this country for this? So you can carry a diploma in your belly, but never a degree? Tu no vas a ser un maldito cuero. Cuero. Cuero, she calls me to my face. The Dominican word for hoe. This is what a cuero looks like. A regular girl pocketless jeans that draw grown men's eyes, long hair, a nose ring, a lip ring, a tongue ring, extra earrings, any ring, but a diamond one on her left hand. Skirts, shorts, tank tops, spaghetti, straps. A cuero lets the world know she is hot. She can feel the sun. A spectacular girl with too much ass, too much lip, too much sass. Hips that look like water waiting to be spilled into the hands of thirsty boys. A plain girl with nothing yamativo, nothing that calls attention. A forgotten girl. One who parts her hair down the middle, who doesn't have cleavage, whose mouth doesn't look like it is forever waiting. Un maldito cuero. I am a cuero, and they're right. I hope they're right. I am, I am, I am. I'll be anything that makes sense of this panic. I'll loosen myself from this painful flesh. See, si, a cuero is any skin. A cuero is just a covering. A cuero is a loose thing, tied down by no one, fluttering and waving in the wind, flying, flying, gone. Mommy says, there will be no clean in men's hands, even when the dirt has been scrubbed. From beneath nails, when the soap scent from them suspends, in the air there be sins there. Their washed hands know how to make a dish rag of your spine, wring your neck. Don't look for pristine handling when men use your tears for pine saw. They'll mop the floor with your pride. There be no clean there, girl. Their fingers were made to scratch dirt. To find it in the best of things, make your heart a brillo pad. Brittle and steel, don't be no damn sponge. Their fingers don't know how to squeeze nicely. Nightly, if you imagine men's kisses, soft touches, a caress, remember Adam was made from clay that stains the hand. Remember that Eve was easily tempted. Repetition. Mommy's hard hands make me dizzy and nauseous. Mommy prays and prays while my knees bite into grains of rice. Mommy repeats herself while her statue of the Virgin watches. The whole house witnesses as I pray this steep steep price. Things you think while you're kneeling on rice that have nothing to do with repentance. I once watched my father peel an orange without once removing the knife from the fruit. He just turned and turned and turned it like a globe being skinned. The orange peel becoming a curl, the inside exposed and bleeding. 
how easily he separated everything that protected the fruit and then passed the bowl to my mother, dropping that skin to the floor while the inside burst between her teeth. Another thing you think while you're kneeling on rice that has nothing to do with repentance. My mother has never had soft hands. Even when I was a child, they were rough, from pushing wooden mops and scrubbing tiles. But when I was little, I didn't mind. We would walk down the street and I would rub her calluses. She would smile and say, I was her premio for hard work. I was her premio for patience. And I loved being her reward, the golden trophy of her life. I just don't know when I got too big for the appointed pedestal. The last thing you think while you're kneeling on rice that has nothing to do with repentance. How you will have deep si grain sized indents on your knees. How lucky you are your jeans protect the skin from breaking. How you will be walking slow to school. How kneeling on pews was never as bad as this. How neither your father nor brother say anything. How you feel cold but blood has rushed to your face. How your fists are clenched but they have nothing to hit. How the stinging pain shoots up your thighs. How you've never gritted your teeth this tight. How it hurts less if you force yourself still, still, still. How pointless these thoughts are, any of them. How kissing should never hurt so much. Leaving. Twin presses a bag of frozen mixed vegetables against my knees and another against my cheek. You're lucky, you know. She's growing old. She didn't make you kneel very long. And with the sting still fresh on my skin, I'm not in a place to nod. But I know it's true. Sio, just don't get in trouble until we can leave. Soon we can leave for college. I've never heard Twin sound so desperate. Never thought he dreamed of leaving, just like me. I try not to be resentful he skipped a grade and will escape sooner. I try not to be upset at his soft touch. I elbow him away, afraid of how my hands want to hurt everything around me. What do you need from me? It's such a simple question. But when Carida texts Twin the message to show to me, I look at him and hand the phone back. I'm not mad that he told her. I know they're both just worried. But all I need is to give in to what I wouldn't let myself do in front of mommy. I curl into a ball and weep. Consequences. My mother drops the word no like a hundred grains of rice. I will kneel in these too. No cell phone, no lunch money, no afternoons off from church, no boys, no texting, no hanging out after school, no freedom, no time to myself, no getting out of confession with Father Sean this Sunday. Late that night, the only person I want to talk to is a mom. And although Twin offers to let me use his phone, I don't know what I'd say. That we had a great day and that it all fell apart. That my heart hurts more than my knees. That we can't be together anymore. That I would take that beating again to be with him. Maybe there are no words to say. I just want to be held. Friday, November 9th, in front of my locker. I'm so out of it the next morning. As I put my things away in my locker that I don't notice the group of guys circling near until one bumps me, both his hands palming and squeezing my ass. And I can tell by how his boys laugh, how he smirks while saying, oops, that this was not an accident. I scan the hall. Other kids have slowed down. Some girls whisper behind their hands. 
the group of boys laugh, begin walking away. Out of the corner of my eyes, I see Amon slowing to a standstill, his smile fading. For the first time since I can remember, I wait. I can't fight today. Everything inside me feels beaten, and maybe I won't have to. Aman is here. He'll do something about it. Of course, as a boy who cares about me, he's not going to let someone touch me and make me feel so damn small inside. Of course, as someone who I've talked to about how weird it feels to be stared at and touched like public property, he'll know how much this bothers me. But Aman doesn't move. All the things I needed to tell him about last night, all the things that have changed since we last kissed on the train, evaporate in the heat of my anger. I feel my knees throbbing, the rice bruises pressing into the fabric of my sweats, and I think about how Aman is the reason I was punished in the first place. He's not going to throw a punch. He's not going to curse or throw a fit. He's not going to do a damn thing. Because no one will ever take care of me but me. Pushing away from my locker, I face the dude who groped me. Push him hard in the back. He stumbles, but before he can react, I look him dead in the eye. If you ever touch me again, I'll put my nails through every pimple in your fucking face. I push my locker closed and grill Aman before walking away. That goes for you too. Thanks for nothing.